Welcome to Bookview. Now, life at 35,000 feet is challenging, especially for flying passengers. Cramped legroom, no seats, no, ego, no elbow room. We pay for food, we pay for baggage, we pay for drinks. Even Ryanair here in the EU once proposed a fee for using onboard toilets. First, please make sure that your seatbelt is securely fastened. Seatbelts can be purchased for $5. To fasten, insert the metal fitting into the buckle and tighten the buckle by pulling the loose end away from you. To release, purchase a release flap for $7. <laughs> now I know what you're thinking. We've never paid for seatbelts before. Imagine though what life is like from the perspective of those whose chosen profession is to give those flight safety demonstrations and push the tiny overfilled food and beverage carts up and down the aisle. Well, until this past weekend, I had some idea, having seen these smartly dressed men and women trundled cases across many an airport lobby. But there's a newfound respect here gained from a book by flight attendant Heather Poole. She's author of the New York Times bestseller, Cruising Attitude, tales of crash pads, crew drama, and crazy passengers at 35,000 feet. Now, Heather's worked for a major U.S. carrier for almost 17 years. Her work has been published in the best women's travel writing of 2010, and her column, Galley Gossip, Confessions from the Jump Seat with Heather Poole, can be found on AOL's award-winning website, gadling.com. Now, she's appeared, been mentioned in, or appeared on Good Morning America, 2020, CNN, Headline News, Fox and Friends, Ricky Lake, The Weather Channel, and on and on and on, and she's been in print publications such as National Geographic, The Wall Street Journal, New York Times, etc. Heather Poole, Welcome to Bookview. Hi, how are you? Now, I had to be one of your first couple of thousand followers on Twitter. I started following at Heather underscore Poole, P-O-O-L-E, almost immediately after you joined. And if I'm not mistaken, you've been on there since mid-2008? Oh, gosh, has it been that long? Oh, no. But I do remember one of my first followers, and I think I was one of your, I don't know if I was one of your first followers, but you were one of the first people I started to follow, too. And here you, here we are. Now your live real-time stories of various legs and passengers are laugh out loud funny, especially when you talk about demanding air customers. So I'm so glad you wrote this book. So let's start with how did this book come into being? Oh my gosh, it's kind of a long story, but I've been writing a book called Stewardess about a serial killing flight attendant, which was, I thought, a dark comedy. Only, only I'd send it off to the publishers and they'd be like, we love your voice, and we love your stories, but can you make it fun? And I was like, never, I'll never make it fun. I'm not a fun writer. So um, I never sold it. And, and then I got pregnant and I couldn't really write because my mind turned to mush. And my sister started a blog for my son. And just to keep the creative juices flowing, I just kind of kept writing about flying and family and trying to do the two at the same time. And then my sister, who you know, she wanted to make sure her friends weren't coming to my blog because she was embarrassed, um, put a tracking device on it to see like how people were coming and who, where they were coming from. And all, it was strange. All of a sudden I had like all these Russian visitors and they were all coming from looking up airline keywords. I'm like, Oh, so I put my son's blog somewhere else and I started a new blog and I, you know, I knew that book, the book business is a business after all. And I felt like I needed to show that I had a following to sell a book. So I started blogging for AOL and writing funny stories. And then one of the publishing houses who rejected me came and said, hey, how about you write a book for us? And uh, it became a memoir, so it, it was funny. And so I did everything I said I wouldn't do. <laughs> I have great respect for flight attendants. And I have to say from the title, I was expecting an almost Irma Bombeck-like collection of funny short stories. But this book was also quite serious. It was a real eye-opener. I was impressed with the depth of narrative experience that one finds here. I mean, you literally trace the steps of a flight attendant career in great detail. How did this format come into being? Well, first of all, I, I read all the other books, and those books were already out there. Blogging really helped because I got immediate feedback from people who were actually interested in what I was writing. And at first, I thought I was writing for flight attendants, but who wants to read what they already do for a living? And it was like the questions I would get from blogging, I was like, really? People don't know that? I just... I guess when you're really close to something, you don't realize what people don't really are interested in. So, um, you know, for instance, I remember telling my husband once that we started the ovens on the ground before takeoff. We started cooking the meals. And he was just shocked by that. Like, that was a big deal to him. And I'm like, 
that's so strange. So, you know, I just kind of kept taking notes and I read all the other books and I, and I read the reviews on those books. And a lot of people said, well, you know, I, there weren't more stories. I knew that people wanted to hear stories in the sky. So I knew, I knew I needed to start the book out in the sky. And I also knew that I wanted to do something different that hadn't been done. And Coffee to Your Me was a great book and it's very famous. But what's interesting about that, it was written by a man, it's kind of a marketing ploy. The guy just met some flight attendants in the bar, pretended to, you know, took on a fake name to market the book. So I kind of wanted to do a real life version of that modern, in this modern day, because travel's changed so much. And I wanted to take people on a journey. Like I wanted my mother-in-law to understand why I couldn't make long-term plans, you know, or my sister to understand why I didn't know where I was going to be for Christmas. Because I've been doing this job for 17 years and still the people who are closest to me don't understand it. And I just thought it would be nice if I didn't have to explain so much. And then also with new people who want to come in and take on this career, it's not a job, it's a lifestyle. And that's what people don't understand. I mean, Millions of people can go out and pick up trash and take drink orders, but they forget we're gone. We're away from home for seven days, you know, at a time. And I would say 99% of the people out there couldn't do that. So, you know, I just wanted to kind of show what it's really like. So let's talk a bit about the hiring experience. I have to tell you, I was stunned by the almost boot camp nature of your training experience and the pressure. I'm also rather naive, so I thought one could easily learn the ropes, but studying the specifications of each aircraft in your fleet under numerous high-pressure situations and, and watching your class, already a highly selective process just to get there, being cut from over, over 60, I think it was like 65, to 40, making it to wings pinning. Describe the pressure of how that all works for us. It's just something you really can't describe. I had such a hard time with that chapter. It was probably the hardest one I, I could write because I was really trying to explain it, but still keep people interested because there's so many details that go into it. I didn't want to bore everybody. But, I mean, the only way I can explain it is maybe American Idol, how they, you know, they stay up all late at night and they study the songs. And they have to memorize it word for word and they get one thing wrong, they're gone. It's kind of the same thing because we are up all night practicing up early in the morning. And I think the airlines are just, you know, getting you prepared for what your life is going to be like. Cause you know, I get to a hotel room and I think I'm going to be able to sleep in until 10 AM. And then I got a call at three that the crew the night before didn't come in and I got to be out the door at five. You, you just can't be, you can't be prepared. If you're not a flexible person, this job is not for you. And it is very stressful. And we, I mean, I guess they just want to, you know, if, if you snap, they want, I guess they want to make sure you're not going to snap when you're working, <laughs> you know, so they put you in a lot of stressful situations, but it's kind of silly because it's like, it's like they've given you 200 nursery rhymes to memorize. And if you get one word wrong, you're gone. So the nursery rhymes are easy, but you have to remember all of them every night, every day, a different set. So it's just, it's strange. And I, I kid you not, I have been flying for 17 years now and we go back every year for recurrent training and I get sick. I mean, everyone gets sick before they go back. It's just, that's how bad it is. I like on Facebook and I see people who've gone down to the training center and they post a picture of the training center. I swear, I feel like I'm going to throw up when I see it. That's how bad it was. And it sounds so silly, but we all dread it and we've been through it and we've passed it and we've been doing it for, you know, some of us 20, maybe even more years and we're still bothered by it. And then you talk about how your ordeal was only beginning, getting your crew base assignment and literally being told you've got to move right then and there to a new home in New York from Dallas. Now, I don't know about you, but moving is already very high on the stressor list. Talk a little bit about the culture shock of a girl from, you know, Big D, Dallas, moving into the Big Apple, New York City. Well, I mean, it goes even farther back from that. Like when you go to training, you don't know where you're going to be based, but you have to pack for your base before you leave for training. So you don't even know what to pack because you don't know if you're going to Chicago or Salt Lake City or who knows, maybe Hawaii. And you're in training for seven and a half weeks. And then you, when you leave training, you don't get to go home and like get set up. You go straight to base and you're flying on an airplane working in like three, four days. So it's really stressful. Like I felt like I was going off to war, especially when your family flies in to see you get your pen, you get your wings pinned and then, and then they send you off and that's it. You've got 30 minutes to say goodbye. And then you're going off to a place you've never been to. And New York, like I had to find a place to live and 
I didn't know, I didn't know you're supposed to tip the super money to get an apartment. I couldn't figure out why I couldn't find an apartment. And you know, we're, we're paid like new flight attendants are paid. I was paid 18,000 a year my first year. What's crazy about that is flight attendants are now paid less. And that's the, um, the base pay for a, a large airline and smaller airlines are paid like 14,000 a year. Now imagine going to New York and trying to find a place to live. So people are like, how do you do it? That's when the crash pad comes in. We have to live 20 people to a room with bunk beds and army like barrack facility, you know, there's no other way to do it. Now, when we return for part two of our talk with Heather Poole, we'll look at the pressures of commuting across the country to her day job and the work-life balance that has to be achieved when traveling seven straight days being away from your family. You're watching Book View with Dennis Campbell. Stay right here.